Welcome back to Season 2 of 12 Days in March. In this section, we'll be covering diseases of the aorta for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a free PDF is available for download at the 12 Days website. I've broken this topic into a two-part presentation to keep you fresh and on top of your game. With little effort, you should have no problem nailing the key aorta derivatives come test day. In this first video, we'll cover aneurysm and dissection. In part two, we'll cover the key components of coarctation and aortitis. In reviewing aneurysm, the key focus will be on risk factors and pathology. Nothing too exciting. Dissection gets a little bit dicier with key features that include risk factors, clinical presentation, underlying pathology, and a boatload of complications. Comparing and contrasting these two entities forms the basis of NBME inquiries. Coarctation can be a bit tricky, but we'll take a very practical approach focusing on severity of stenosis, disease associations, and the associated entity of PDA to clarify the manifestations and derivative issues. And finally, we'll cover aortitis in brief with a focus on Takayosu and syphilis. These two get some airtime only because they represent the prototypic inflammatory and infectious etiologies causing aortitis. And with this brief introduction, we can launch into the key disease features. So what do you need to know about aortic aneurysms? Note first the graphic. This is an abdominal aneurysm. For purposes of the boards, the discussion on aneurysm is very generic and they make no particular distinction between thoracic and abdominal disease. The key background features include the presence of atherosclerosis and tobacco use. Hypertension and hyperlipidemia are risk factors for atherosclerosis and are therefore predisposing factors. The classic demographic feature will be a male over the age of 65. I know you're thinking Sachs forgot to include diabetes. Well, it turns out, for unclear reasons, perhaps related to fibrosis, that diabetes is a negative risk factor for aneurysm. That is, the presence of diabetes reduces the risk of aneurysm formation. This is an interesting observation, but not test-worthy fodder. Pathology is the key slide for the aneurysm section. The pathologic hallmark includes transmural inflammation of the vessel wall. Lymphocytes and macrophages predominate. As with the vulnerable plaque in the discussion of coronary artery disease, macrophages elaborate, matrix metalloproteinases, and elastases, both of which lead to degradation of the extracellular matrix. Loss of matrix results in weakening and expansion of the aortic wall. These are the key steps to be familiar with in aneurysm formation. The graphics are included to underscore the key features of vessel wall inflammation and the elaboration of matrix metalloproteinases by the macrophages. It is worth noting that poor perfusion of the vasovasorum contributes to vessel breakdown by creating a relatively ischemic state. This will become a recurrent theme. The clinical presentation for abdominal aneurysm will include a palpable or pulsatile mass. Certainly they can rupture with catastrophic consequences, but this hasn't been a major focus for the boards. Diagnosis is made through imaging modalities, including ultrasonography or angiography. In fact, a one-time screen is recommended for male smokers at the age of 65. The management includes serial assessment until they hit a size cutoff. I list 5.5 to 6 centimeters as cutoffs for surgery, but other circumstances may dictate earlier or later intervention. This is material for step two. In terms of intervention, surgery is the mainstay of management. Historically, open surgical procedures with high morbidity was the mainstay. Transitioning to endovascular repair is truly an amazing advance in modern surgical techniques. Two quick disclaimers. You will repeatedly see the graphic of abdominal auscultation displayed. No reason to ever hit the play media button. The examiner is always listening for the bruise of renal artery stenosis or high-pitched bowel sounds. Both these will be distinguished by the vignette. I mention this as aneurysms themselves are not associated with bruies. The other disclaimer is that aneurysms for the boards are pretty bland. Other than pathogenesis as reviewed in pathology, not much great test fodder. Dissection is quite a bit more interesting as we're about to see. As we transition to dissection, I want to emphasize a couple of key points straight away. You will need to be familiar with the concept of the intimal tear as the initiating step. The graphic demonstrates the consequence of that tear. Blood dissects the media, creating a tissue flap, called an intimal flap, while also demonstrating a false lumen. The false lumen represents hematoma that collects in the dissected vessel wall. Next key point, 
The language of dissection is essentially diagnostic on the boards, so when they describe the abrupt onset of ripping, tearing, or knife-like pain in the mid-chest that radiates to the back, the diagnosis is aortic dissection. Of course, then they will ask you a derivative, but you can't get the derivative unless you make the correct diagnosis. Insofar as demographics, you can expect the patient to be described as either a hypertensive or to have clinical features of Marfan syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos can also be associated with dissection. One of the major derivatives of this topic is where the dissection travels and what it destroys along the way. If it propagates proximally to the aortic root, derivatives will focus on hemopericardium with tamponade and or the acute onset of aortic regurgitation. If the dissection travels antegrade, any branch vessel may be affected, but the renal arteries are a particular favorite of the NBME. And with this key information under your belt, we can now launch into the topic. So as we just mentioned, the key risk factor for dissection is hypertension. The other subgroup will be those patients who are genetically predisposed to the pathologic lesion of cystic medial necrosis. Marfan's is an example, but other conditions can also cause this lesion, as we'll discuss. Insofar as pathogenesis, it is thought that the shear forces associated with hypertension initiate a tear in the intima. This is depicted in the left graphic. Once torn and under high systemic pressures, blood literally tears or dissects through the laminar planes of the media layer. Insofar as pathology, the majority of patients with dissection have either normal histology or evidence of hypertensive changes in the vasovasorum. Here again, as with aneurysm, decreased vessel wall perfusion from the vasovasorum leads to some measure of degradation in the extracellular matrix of the media. And whereas this may be clinically important, it is hardly the focus of inquiry by the NBME. They are more interested in the characteristic lesion of cystic medial necrosis. So what is cystic medial necrosis? It simply represents fragmentation of elastic fibers with deposition of proteoglycans that create a cyst-like appearance, cystic medial necrosis. Of equal importance when comparing and contrasting with aneurysm is the absence of transmural inflammation. This is a key distinguishing pathologic feature. They like distinguishing features. Since both Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos can cause cystic medial necrosis, let me spend one quick moment contrasting the two. In Marfan's, as you are aware, there is a mutation of the fibrillin-1 gene. Fibrillin normally serves as a scaffolding for the deposition of elastin. So Marfan's is characterized by a failure of elastin. So where is elastin found? Most relevant to this discussion, it is found in the blood vessel wall, and this failure is expressed by aortic dissection. This is a big deal. It is the number one cause of death in patients with Marfan syndrome. Elastin is also found in the periosteum of bones. Failure of elastin in the periosteum contributes to the MSK features of Marfan's. And finally, it is found in the suspensory ligament of the lens, accounting for the frequent description of lens subluxation. If you consider the function of fibrillin-1, the clinical manifestations make sense. Contrast that with the Ehlers-Danlos family of disorders. I use the term family to highlight that Ehlers-Danlos is not a single entity, rather there are several subtypes characterized by an alteration of the genes which affect the synthesis or processing of collagen. To distinguish from Marfan's, I think of the hyperdistensible skin associated with Ehlers-Danlos. You can pull on the skin and it snaps back into place. This snapping back is dependent on elastin, so we know the elastin is intact. It is the collagen which doesn't work. So failure of collagen in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome translates into joint hypermobility and tissue fragility. Tissue fragility, in turn, is represented by spontaneous organ rupture or, you guessed it, blood vessel dissection. Moving on from pathology to the clinical presentation, the patient with dissection will be described by the abrupt onset of severe chest pain. Abrupt means they can tell you the exact time. That's pretty abrupt. It may radiate to the mid or upper back and will be described on the boards as a ripping, tearing, or knife-like sensation. When the NBME uses those terms, ripping, tearing, or knife-like, they are begging you to diagnose aortic dissection. Other features that may be described include pulse asymmetry and or pulse deficit. And that makes sense seeing how the vessel is ceasing to function. Unlike aneurysm, the clinical manifestation of dissection are many-fold, varied, and catastrophic. 
I've organized them into organ hypoperfusion and damage to the aortic root. In terms of organ hypoperfusion, any aortic branch can be impacted, but the big ticket items are the carotids manifested by stroke-like symptoms. The renal arteries may also be affected. These patients will present with acute kidney injury and symptoms of flank pain with probable hematuria. This is yet another condition associated with the activation of the renin angiotensin system. Inquiries would be fair game. And then we have the ever popular shock-like presentation. Tamponade will be covered shortly, but do be aware that the coronary vessels can also dissect, presenting with MI, or the tear can find its way through the adventitia, and the patient can exsanguinate bleeding into the thorax or peritoneum. Scary stuff. Besides organ hypoperfusion, dissection can cause damage to the aortic root. That's not good. Damage to this region is going to manifest with acute failure of the aortic valve or hemopericardium with tamponade. Insofar as the acute onset of aortic insufficiency, the patient will have chest pain plus the acute onset of congestive heart failure with a characteristic widened pulse pressure and or hypotension. There will be a diastolic murmur, but probably at the right sternal border given the acuity. Just to be clear, in acute aortic insufficiency, there is no time for cardiac compensation, so the typical left sternal border murmur of chronic aortic insufficiency associated with eccentric hypertrophy does not evolve. This is not test material, but does highlight the difference between acute and chronic aortic insufficiency. Just to remind you, tamponade is discussed in full detail in the separate 12 days video on pericardial disorders. In the context of dissection, the patient will present with shock and the pathognomonic pulsus paradoxus. It is reasonable for them to describe a patient presenting with chest pain radiating to the back and the description of pulsus paradoxus noted in this vignette by a drop in blood pressure during inspiration. They go on to ask which of the following will be found at autopsy and then ask some other feature of dissection as just reviewed. There is one other disorder related to dissection and that is aortic trauma. Be aware that the ascending and descending aorta are relatively mobile compared to the arch. In fact, the arch is fixed in place by the ligamentum arteriosum, which is the fibrous remnant of the ductus arteriosus. If this gentleman drives his car off a cliff and tears his aorta, Will will the tear occur? The ligamentum literally yanks a piece of the aorta off, creating a whole and rapid exsanguination. Drive carefully. And here is a summary of the key features reviewed in this video. Be familiar with the risk factors, demographics, and clinical presentation. Be familiar with the pathology, especially noting inflammation and the macrophage elaboration of matrix metalloproteinases compared with the characteristic cystic medial necrosis lesion of dissection. And that concludes this discussion of aneurysm and dissection. In part two of this discussion, we'll undertake a functional approach to coarctation with a brief review of aortitis. As always, if you have any questions or concerns about any of the material covered, please email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.